Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's Policy and Blood Cancer Awareness Month Advocacy Teleconference. During today's call, you will hear from expert speakers and will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box on the right side of your webinar screen. If you're listening by telephone, you will be able to ask questions during our Q&A sessions. As a reminder, this teleconference is being recorded. And now I'm pleased to introduce Kenya Hart. Kenya Hart is the D Director of Communications and Marketing for the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Kenya. Thank you, and thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us for today's Policy and Blood Cancer Awareness Month update teleconference. Before I introduce you to our first expert speaker, I'd like to give a brief introduction of the Foundation's advocacy program. The Lymphoma Research Foundation recognizes that public policy is critical to achieving its mission to eradicate lymphoma and serve those touched by this disease. Toward that end, the Foundation is committed to advocating on behalf of the entire lymphoma community in support of this mission by working collaboratively with policymakers, the medical community, patient advocates, and other stakeholders to advance those efforts that will improve the lives of those impacted by blood cancer. The Foundation and its network of more than 5,000 grassroots advocates across the United States support policy measures which will increase federal funding for lymphoma research and education and ensure patients have access to high quality cancer care. We invite you to join us and become an advocate for the foundation and greater lymphoma community. There are many ways to become involved from sending an email to your representative in Congress to attending in-person meetings with members of Congress to educate them about lymphoma. You can learn more and sign up to become an advocate at lymphoma.org advocacy. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you to the program's first speaker, Shelley Fold Nasso. Shelley Fold Nasso is the Chief Executive Officer for the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, where she advocates to transform the cancer care system for everyone touched by cancer. NCCS engages in public policy efforts to improve cancer care and empower survivors and caregivers to be a voice in public policy debates. Welcome, Shelley. Thank you, Kenya. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this teleconference today. I'm really honored to, um, to be a guest speaker here today. Um, we are really grateful for our partnership with the Lymphoma Research Foundation. We work closely on a number of different policy issues, including the Cancer Care Planning and Communications Act that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here with you all today. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this legislation, the Cancer Care Planning and Communications Act that was introduced this summer by Congressman Mark Desaunier and Buddy Carter. Congressman Desaunier and Carter are the co-chairs of the Congressional Cancer Survivors Caucus. And in fact, Congressman Desaunier is a CLL patient and survivor. Um, he is from California and was treated at Georgetown in um, the Washington, D.C. area, and he's talked very openly about his cancer experience. And he found that we needed more focus on the issues that cancer survivors face. So last year, he um, founded the cancer survivor, Congressional Cancer Survivors Caucus uh, with another cancer survivor, um, Ted Poe, from Texas. Congressman Poe did not run for re-election last, um, last year, and this year, uh, Congressman DeSaunier recruited Buddy Carter from Georgia to be his co-chair for the caucus. Buddy Carter is a, a, a pharmacist. I think he's the only pharmacist in Congress, and he's not a cancer survivor himself, but has a lot of cancer in his family, and I've met with him several times, and he's very committed to the issues that cancer patients and cancer survivors face. So we're really lucky to have two people who work well together as a, in a bipartisan way and who are very invested in the issues that cancer survivors deal with on a regular basis that are working with us with this caucus and that worked with us to introduce this legislation. It's been introduced in the past, so some of you who may be long-term advocates may have been familiar with the previous version of this legislation, um, which was at one point called the PACT Act for Planning Actively for Cancer Treatment. 
but Congressman Desani was very focused on the communications piece as being really important to highlight in the legislation, and he wanted to change the title to reflect that, so that it is not just about a cancer care plan, but it is also about the communication between patient and the care team, and then between different members of the care team. So what the legislation would do would be to create a new Medicare service for cancer care planning. And this service would be available for providers to, to provide to patients both at diagnosis, when there's any kind of change in the treatment plan because of either progression of disease or recurrence or, um, or any other reason that there's a change in the treatment plan. And then at the completion of treatment and transition to survivorship. So there's these multiple points during the cancer journey that this service would be available. And right now we know that while cancer care plans are sometimes provided, they're not it's not as frequent as we think it should be. We hear from patients that they don't receive a plan at the beginning of their treatment. They don't receive a survivorship care plan at the conclusion of their treatment that would allow them to help communicate with other providers, especially the primary care provider who may not have been in the loop on their cancer treatment about what treatment they've received, what are some of the side effects and that they may be experiencing, what are some of the long-term issues that they may face in the future that they need to be aware of to manage their own health, and then also to work with their primary care and other providers um, to manage the potential late effects of their cancer treatment. Um, we just hear that, that, that patients don't receive that most of the time. I think it's, you know, the, the percentage of patients who receive survivorship care plans is fairly low. We know that. Um, what we hear from providers is they struggle to do it because they're in part, in large part, because they're not reimbursed for the time it takes to put this plan together. They're reimbursed for the time that they spend meeting with the patient face to face. But part of this planning is done behind the scenes and done by other members of the care team, not just the, the physician who's the one who is meeting with the patient and billing Medicare. So this, what we believe that this Medicare service would do is provide that incentive for the providers to really work together as a team to give something to patients that they need that may include work that's behind the scenes, not just during that face-to-face -face visit with patients. Um, it is focused on Medicare, but we know that Medicare serves more than half of cancer patients and that it is also a model for how uh, private insurers. So if Medicare covers something, then private insurers are likely to follow. So it's much harder to legislate what private insurers will offer than it is to, to legislate what Medicare will do. So we start with Medicare, and then we hope that if Medicare were to add this service, then other private payers would follow. So that is a question we often receive about why this is just focused on Medicare. It's, all, it's part of it is just how you legislate and how um, insurance plans are governed, but whether it's by federal government or by state government. Um, but also it is just that Medicare is the largest provider of cancer care in the country. So if you start with the sort of the biggest fish to fry and then you hope that you can get the private insurers to cover this after they see, after they follow Medicare's lead. So, um, the reason why we think this is important to patients is that it'll help them give this roadmap both at the beginning of treatment and at that transition to survivorship. And that it will also promote shared decision making with patients and their care teams and then empower patients with the information that they need to manage and coordinate their care. One of the things that we've heard from our colleagues at the Lymphoma Research Foundation is that lymphoma patients are very, very savvy to the, the fact that they may have to sequence treatments over time and that planning those treatments is really important to, to you as lymphoma patients because um, you know that there's going to be a sequence of treatments. So that's why we've had such a great collaboration with the Lymphoma Research Foundation working on this legislation because we know how important it is to, to you all, to the patients and if affected by lymphoma to have this planning as a part of the decision making about care and really to be thinking not just about your current treatment, but what the next treatment may be. And we believe this kind of uh, Medicare service for cancer care planning would help foster that. 
So a lot of organizations have endorsed the legislation and we're continuing to add um, organizations supporting it. And what's important here is that it's both patient groups who know that this is important to the patients that they serve and then providers who know that having this Medicare service would help them to provide better care to their patients. So some of the groups supporting it are professional societies of different groups of providers that work with cancer patients, but also individual cancer centers um, that have expressed that this would help them to better serve their patients. And we're continuing to add organizations endorsing the, the legislation. It's, it's a piece of legislation that is not controversial and that no one is opposed to it but it's really hard to get attention around it. And so that's where you, your help can come in in terms of, of talking to your members of Congress about why this would be important to you. Um, we do have information on our website, um, canceradvocacy.org slash ccpca. We have a fact sheet on the legislation. We have an example of, of some sample care plans and some other information about the legislation if you'd like to take a look at it. And Kenya is going to talk to you about how you can take action to urge your congressman to, or congresswoman to support the legislation. Thank you, Shelley, for that wonderful introduction and update on the Cancer Care Planning and Communications Act. If you would like to urge your members of Congress to support this bill, visit lymphoma.org slash action center after the teleconference to send a standard email in which you can personalize. Now I'd like to turn over the program to our moderator for Q&A on the Cancer Care Planning and Communications Act. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask for your questions, go to the Q&A box on the right side of your screen and type your question now, or if on the telephone and would like to ask a question live, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. I'll now turn the program back over to you, Kenya, for Q&A on the Cancer Care Planning and Communications Act. Thank you. Our first question is from Victor. How long does it usually take for private insurers to enact changes on their end after Medicare does? Thanks, Victor. That's a really great question. Um, I don't know that there's a typical time frame because, I mean, we do know that private insurers have their own, um, they're not necessarily required to follow Medicare, but what it does is it gives us the ability to go in and advocate and say, look, Medicare is doing this now. We'd like to see you do it as well. Um, and so, sometimes the private insurers are ahead of Medicare and sometimes they're following Medicare. So I don't think there's a standard time frame of how long it usually takes, but it certainly having Medicare cover something gives you leverage to go to the private payers and get them to cover it as well. Our next question is from Jesse. How has the role of patient advocates in cancer research evolved? Well, this uh, I will give my per my perspective and I know Kenya, you may want to chime in with some with your perspective as well. But I, I've seen a, over the last 10 years a huge increase in the uh, bringing patient advocates into the research process earlier, really at the conceptualization of the research question. And you, I see that researchers are, are hungry for patient involvement, even at the basic research level where they don't get to spend as much time with, they, they're not treating patients, but they want to talk to patients about their research and learn from them about the questions that are most important to patients. So I think it's evolved over time, but, I, but I've definitely seen an increase in the involvement of patients. It used to be that patients were just involved in, patient advocates were involved in reviewing research and deciding what research to fund through the National Cancer Institute and the Department of Defense um, congressionally directed medical research programs. But it, I'm seeing it more and more in other areas, not just in the deciding what to fund, but also in really the conceptualization of the research question and in um, the you know, ongoing conduct of the research project. One area I've seen uh, lots of stories of where patient advocate involvement in the research has shaped the research question is when it comes to clinical trials. And um, a, a trial protocol may be proposed to have, you know, seven blood draws. And the patient advocate 
involved may say, well, why do we need seven? Is there any way we can streamline this? Because that's a huge burden on patients. And and it's not um, it's not a knock on, on researchers, but they're not necessarily thinking of the burden on patients. So having patients involved in the discussions early really helps to bring those questions to the forefront in terms of the design of the, of the study protocols. Great, thank you, Shelley. And one last question from Victor. Do care plans usually incorporate psychosocial needs as well? So that's a great question. Um, they should. Um, they don't always, but I think that um, that is, there's increasing, um, you know, what we hear from patients, we did a survey this earlier this year and um, of almost 1,400 patients. And what we heard was that they felt like, and, and I'm sure this will resonate with, with people on the call, that the physical side effects of cancer treatment are much better addressed than the psychosocial needs. And I think that, you know, we have to keep that drumbeat going in terms of helping providers understand that that is really important to patients and needs to be part of the treatment plan and part of the ongoing treatment and uh, and support of the patient through their treatment. Um, I don't think we're there yet. We have a long way to go, but that's why care plans could be useful because if they have that element as part something that needs to be addressed in the plan, then that's another a prompt for the the care team to really ask the patient how they're doing and understand what their needs may be and if they can't address them, help refer patients to someone who can help them. Great. Thank you again, Shelley, for um, providing an update on the Cancer Care Planning and Communications Act and answering uh, questions from our callers. Um, I'd like to move on to our next speaker, Jeremy Scott. Uh, Jeremy Scott is a Senior Director of Government Affairs in the Powers, Piles, Sutter, and Verville Legislative Practice, where he focuses on health care policy and representing the interests of nonprofit advocacy and health organizations. He works with his clients to establish and strengthen relationships with elected officials and federal agencies, as well as develop and implement innovative, innovative government relation and advocacy programs. He also helps his clients by bringing traditional and non-traditional partners to the table in support of common goals, fostering relationships with members of Congress and their staff, and collaborating with the administration and federal agencies. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you, Kenya, and, and thank you uh, for having me today. Um, uh, I uh, Thank you for that introduction. I, I, um, I represent the Coalition to Improve Access to Cancer Care, which is a, a coalition made up of uh, patient advocacy groups in the cancer space, health providers in the cancer space, hospital systems, and the pharmaceutical industry. So uh, ordinarily strange bedfellows, but with this particular issue that I will discuss today, uh, it makes perfect sense. Uh, on a personal note, this is both professionally and personal for me. Um, I uh, lost my uh, wife to breast cancer five years ago, and we actually uh, were impacted by uh, the oral chemotherapy parity issue that I'm going to lay out here today. I also represent a couple of individual uh, cancer organizations, uh, both in the blood and solid tumor, as well as the hemoc pharmacist, so just to, to give you my background. so. Uh, what what I want to talk about in my time is is the oral parity legislation, in particular, in particular the the Cancer Drug Parity Act. So what we have, the problem that we face is that insurance design has not kept pace with innovation. Um, so as the Congress passes um, and invests more research in NIH and NCI and allows FDA to uh, uh, speed up the process of uh, approving novel therapies. What we have is we have an influx of new therapies, uh, i.e. in the oral cancer space. Um, and so what, uh, if you talk to the pharmaceutical industry, 35% of the future pipeline of cancer drugs is going to be oral therapies. Um, so the problem we have is, is that 
the traditional IV chemotherapy that your oncologist may prescribe for you, depending on the type of cancer you have, uh, is covered under your medical benefit. It's a you know a copay. A copay covers going and getting your labs drawn, read, going down to the infusion center, having someone uh, pharmacist mix the drugs and a, an oncology nurse infuse the drugs. Um, that is again on your copay anywhere twenty, thirty, forty, fifty dollar copay, depending on your your insurer. Um, if your oncologist prescribes you oral chemotherapy, that is on your prescription drug benefit, which becomes a coinsurance. So you typically pay a percentage of that total cost of the drug uh, per month, uh, which can range anywhere from 20 to 30 percent, maybe even higher. So we're talking potentially uh, because of the costly, costliness of the uh, oral chemo can oral chemo drugs or IV chemo drugs for that matter, we're talking uh, tens of thousands of dollars of out-of-pocket for patients. Um, so as I said, this, this band of, 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 of merry folks got together to uh, derive a or come up with a bill that would, would um, fix this problem, which incidentally insurers could do on their own. So uh, what happened was this, uh, a coalition formed to work on this at the state level. So there are state-regulated health plans. Um, they achieved, uh, were able to achieve 43 states plus the District of Columbia to fix this. And what this fix is, is basically saying that if you're an insurer and you offer a cancer benefit, and that cancer benefit has an IV chemotherapy component, you must show no less favorable for orals, meaning that you have to cover the orals at the same place, same spot you would cover um, out of pocket for uh, the IV chemotherapy. So as I said, we've achieved uh, this in 43 states plus the District of Columbia, the problem being that those are state regulated health plans. Um, and uh, uh, so state regulated health plans, um, you know, are limited in the number of folks um, that we're dealing with. Can you, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so again, if you look at this slide, it talks a little bit about that. It talks about how the commercial plans are are looked at from the state and federal perspective. What our bill and what I what we're talking about today is really the federal piece of that, where our bill would amend ERISA. Those are federally regulated health plans, um, and about 60% of of uh, folks patients. Uh, are, are on those federally regulated health plans. Um, so it's a, a wider swath of, of Americans that, that are on those. And so that's essentially what our particular bill is going to be focusing on. Can you click to the next slide, please? So the bill, uh, as I said, it's the Cancer Drug Parity Act. It's H.R. 1730, or in the Senate, S. 741. Both bills were were reintroduced in this Congress uh, at the same time. This is the first time uh, that this has happened. This bill has been introduced in this version, which, which, which was introduced the last three Congresses. There was a bill that was previously introduced in subsequent Congresses, which, um, which, which we amended. Um, so this is the third Congress, so the sixth year we've been um, advocating for this particular bill, and it's the first time that we've been able to have both the House and Senate bill introduced at the same time. Uh, the House bill was introduced by Congressman Guthrie in Kentucky, Bill Arrakis in Florida, Higgins in New York, and Matt Suey in California. Um, these, uh, we targeted these co-sponsors specifically because Guthrie, Bill Arrakis, and Higgins are all on Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over the bill. And um, Congressman Higgins is on Ways and Means Health Subcommittee, which doesn't have jurisdiction, uh, but is still important when we're talking about health care related issues. There are 88 co sponsors, evenly divided amongst Republicans and Democrats. What we do is we do what we call the Noah's Ark approach. So for every Republican or for every Democrat, we have to have the same in order to bring them on. We currently have a list of 30 Democrats that want to go on the bill, so we're waiting on Republican uh, House members to, to, to sponsor that. In the Senate, the bill is introduced by uh, Senator Moran and Wicker uh, and Senator Tina Smith and Chris Murphy of Connecticut. Um, we have 18 co-sponsors currently, again, still doing the Noah's Ark approach. Um, targeting uh, primarily um, 
health committee members because the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee is the one that has jurisdiction over our bill. Um, as I said, this issue is championed by the Coalition to Improve Access to Cancer Care. LRF is actually a steering committee member uh, of the coalition, um, and so again, it's it's uh, it's it's great to have LRF uh, at the leadership um, in this coalition. Next slide. How we talk about this issue? Um, this you've probably heard about the the drug pricing, and Congress is focused on drug pricing. Um, our bill is not a drug pricing issue per se. It is an insurance design benefit problem, again, having insurance not keeping pace with innovation. The problem is, is that when we Congress is talking about drug pricing, the misnomer is, is that they're just talking about the high cost of cancer drugs, which, in fact, if you look at some of the packages that they put together, it goes a little bit beyond just the high cost of drugs, really looking at the supply chain and everyone in between, PBMs, insurers, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. So while I say this is not a drug pricing issue and we kind of keep our issue separate, it could in fact be part of the drug pricing debate. As I said, I, I don't like the term drug pricing. It's a misnomer. They really are focusing on lowering out-of-pocket costs for patients. And if that is the case, then this particular piece of legislation would do that on day one. Um, if you're talking about the high cost of drugs, and they're solely focused on that, again, that doesn't fix our problem. You can make a $200,000 oral cancer uh, drug uh, $100,000, and it's still we still have to pay a coinsurance, a percentage of the $100,000, and for many, many uh, people in America, that's still just too costly. Um, and I, so we talk about it in that way. And then the second point I wanted to ri raise is because we get the, we hear this a lot from Republican offices is that the bill is not a mandate that patients use or oncologists prescribe oral chemotherapy. And it's not a mandate that insurers have to um, now all of a sudden cover oral chemotherapy uh, drugs if they didn't. I said it at the beginning and I'll say it again. Um, what what our bill would do is if you're an insurer and you have a chemotherapy benefit and that chemotherapy benefit has an IV chemotherapy component, then you have to show no less favorable to orals. What this mandate issue gets to is that if you're an insurer and you don't have a cancer benefit and you don't have an IV chemotherapy benefit, then all of a sudden you have to now have an oral. That's a mandate and that's not what our bill is saying. Um, and so I just wanted to be clear on how we as a coalition like to talk about the bill on Capitol Hill because it, it can get very confusing very quickly among staffers. So I will stop there. Thank you, Jeremy, for that wonderful introduction and update on the Cancer Drug Parity Act. If you would like to urge your members of Congress to support this bill, visit lymphoma.org slash action center after the teleconference to send a standard email in which you can personalize. And now I'd like to turn over the program to our moderator for Q&A instructions on the Cancer Drug Parity Act. Great, thank you. Just a reminder to our audience to ask a question, go to the Q&A box on the right side of your screen, or to ask a question live on your telephone, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Now back to Kenya for the Q&A on the Cancer Drug Parity Act. Thank you. Our first question is from Richard. He asks, which representatives and senators in Virginia do we need to support the Cancer Drug Parity Act? Uh, thanks, Richard. It's a good, it's a good question. Um, I can I can tell you that neither of the Virginia senators are actually on the bill as of yet. Again, I, I did mention that we do have a Dems in a waiting list in the House. We also have one in the Senate, so it is highly plausible that either Kane or Warner are on that Dem in waiting list. Um, the House, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, and actually as, you, as I saw the question come in, I quickly tried to get on Thomas. Dot gov uh, to see um, who in the House from Virginia has co-sponsored, and believe it or not, the website is down. Um, so that 
I, I'm unable to tell you that right now. I know that uh, I can get the information to Meg and, and she can get it out to, to you all. Um, but, you know, typically how we try to find who, um, who are co-sponsors of the bill, uh, there are certain websites that we can go to. Congress.gov is one of them, and you can just type in the bill number if you have that or the bill title, and it'll tell you, you know, co-sponsors. It'll tell you um, when the bill is introduced, where it is. Um, but that's one of the quick things that we do um, to try to find that. So I'll make sure I get the information, Kenya, to, to Meg or to you to, to get out to folks. Great. Thank you. And uh, the next question, which you uh, kind of just answered, is how can we tell if our member of Congress um, is a sponsor? Yeah, again, the, the quickest and easiest way is just to go to congress.gov. Um, and then you can type in, again, you can type in the bill number, uh, House HR 1730, or the Senate number, um, and it'll pull it up. Uh, if, you don't know the, if you don't know a bill number, you can type in keyword search, either the title or a, a keyword, and, and find it that way. And like I said, I'll make sure that Kenya, you or Meg, has that information to get out. Thank you. And the last question is from Nicole. She asks, is this different from the Prescription Drug Pricing Reduction Act? Yes, it is different, um, partly because the Prescription Drug Pricing Act um, is, is a larger package that included several provisions. Our provision, our bill, when I mean provision is our bill, was not part of that, uh, that package. So it is different in the sense that our bill is not a part of that bill, and we are working to include uh, our bill either as a standalone or to get included in various packages uh, related to, you know, the work that Congress is doing, again, around drug pricing, even though I hate the term drug pricing, again, package around lowering out-of-pocket costs for patients in whatever form that may look, uh, both either in the House or the Senate. Thank you again, Jeremy, for providing an introduction and update on the Cancer Drug Parity Act and uh, answering questions from our callers. Happy to be a part of it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And lastly, we would like to provide an update on Blood Cancer Awareness Month and the Foundation's BCAM initiative, Light It Red for Lymphoma. Due in large part to LRF's advocacy program, the month of September was designated Blood Cancer Awareness Month by the United States Congress in 2010. Since then, LRF has been a leader in raising public awareness of lymphoma during BCAM and on World Lymphoma Awareness Day through its Light It Red for Lymphoma initiative. Light It Red for Lymphoma is the foundation's signature Blood Cancer Awareness Month initiative where individuals, buildings, landmarks, and businesses are encouraged to shed a light on lymphoma. Light It Red not only raises awareness about this type of blood cancer, but also gives hope to those impacted by this disease. Supporters can change their light bulbs from white to red, raise awareness on social media, and much more. Each year, Light It Red for Lymphoma grows in partnership and support, including our lighting partners. And this year, we have more than 100 partners worldwide committed to lighting red and raising awareness during Blood Cancer Awareness Month including Pier 17 in New York City, the National Concert Hall in Dublin, Ireland, the CN Tower in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Los Angeles International Airport in Los Angeles, California, the Wrigley Building in Chicago, Illinois, Niagara Falls, the Canada Place Sales Light in British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, excuse me, Meet Las Vegas, the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee, and the Woodman Tower in Omaha, Nebraska. We understand that individuals, businesses, and buildings may not have the capability to light red and become a lighting partner, so we provide other fun ways to support BCAM during the month of September, including wearing red on September 15th, which is World Lymphoma Awareness Day, and share photos on social media using the hashtag light it red. You can make a donation or create a team LRF fundraising event. You can share lymphoma facts and infographics on social media using the hashtag Light It Red. You can add a free Light It Red for Lymphoma Facebook frame to your profile picture. Download and share the foundation's Light It Red for Lymphoma awareness and fundraising guide with friends, family, and local businesses. 
And lastly, join the Foundation's Twitter Advocacy Thunderclap on September 1st. On the first day of BCAM, we want to make as loud of a thunderclap as we can on social media. So we'd like to invite you to tweet your members of Congress asking them to support BCAM and lymphoma by wearing red on September 15th. Here you will see instructions on how to find your members of Congress and state governors through C-SPAN's curated Twitter list. And we will be sending a follow-up email to you all with these instructions and instructions on, other on the other advocacy alerts after this teleconference. Lastly, here are some helpful links for the Foundation's social media, hashtags that will be used during the month to raise awareness, and links to the Light at Red materials, including our awareness and fundraising guide, uh, lymphoma facts and infographics, and much more. Now I'd like to turn over the program to our moderator for instructions on Q&A on, on Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you. And again, just a reminder, if you have a question, go to the Q&A box on the right side of your screen, type your text in, or if you would like to ask a question live, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. And back to you, Kenya, for the Q&A on Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you. Our first question from Nicole asks, can I start a fundraiser for LRF during Blood Cancer Awareness Month? And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, through our team LRF program, uh, which is our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising program, you can start a Blood Cancer Awareness Month fundraiser. Um, you can choose whatever type of fundraiser you'd like, whether it's a bake sale or a family gathering, a bowling event. Um, you could use our team LRF team raiser platform to raise funds and uh, share with your family and friends. Um, and you can find more information on how to create a Team LRF fundraiser on our How to Light It Red landing page, which is lymphoma.org slash how to LIR. Thank you so much again to each of you for joining today's advocacy teleconference. Uh, we hope you found the program educational and engaging. As a reminder, this program is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email from the foundation with a link to the recorded teleconference, as well as information regarding the action alerts and Twitter thunderclap discussed during the program. And with that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us today and have a wonderful day.